Is Orlando starting to get a little bit too close to the other side of the shield curse line? Talk about that with Kansas City, right? Maybe if the shield is getting away from you, you say, yeah, that's fine. Take the shield. We'll see you in the postseason. Orlando has not lost a game. I always say this about the psychology of it. I kept saying this about South Carolina women's basketball, and it did not matter, which is what does it do to you mentally if you haven't suffered your first loss before you go into win or go home? And I am really curious what that means for the Orlando Pride. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of The Late Sub. I am your host, Claire Watkins. It is Monday, September 23rd, and we have a lot to dig into. WNBA playoffs. We've got the playoff picture for NWSL. We've got some quick hits on volleyball. We've got some ACC soccer results that were pretty interesting in NCAA soccer, and I want to talk briefly about the U20 World Cup at the very end. Lots of really good stuff to talk about. Welcome to fall, everybody. Much to discuss. Let's jump in. All right. So I think we should start with the sport of the hour. The NBA playoffs have begun. It's amazing what just one week can do in the playoff picture. So if we're speeding up here, going from last week to this week, last week we were still talking about who was going to get the eighth and final spot. I went O for two. It was Atlanta. Congratulations to the Atlanta Dream for making it to that eighth and final playoff spot. And now we already have had our first day of games. I really enjoyed it. It was on Sunday. The whole afternoon slate was just WNBA, WNBA game, just back to back to back to back. I'm watching all eight playoff teams play each other in that best of three series to start the postseason. It was all chalk. We're going to have some stuff to talk about, but also this is not unusual for many different leagues. The first round of the playoffs isn't always that close, especially when you have every team participating. I like having every team participate in the first round of a playoffs. I think that buys, especially in basketball or even in soccer, can sometimes be detrimental to the higher seats. I'm going to talk a little bit about like the, the bug in my brain about the postseason for the WNBA in a little bit, but we had higher teams playing lower seated teams. It kind of went the way you would expect. The Liberty blew out the dream 83 to 69. Shout out to Courtney Vandersloot, who hit the new career playoff assist record. She passed Sue Bird's playoff assist record. Shout out to Courtney Vandersloot, floor general for many, many years. Uh, Connecticut's Marina Mabry, she scored a playoff record 27 points off the bench. Shout out to Marina Mabry. She came over to the Sun in that trade from the Chicago Sky. The Sun handled the fever very, very well in 93 to 69. Uh, Nafisa Collier, MVP runner up. And we'll talk about that in a second too. She scored 38 points in Minnesota's 102 to 95 victory over Phoenix. That game looked like it was going to be a blowout. And then Phoenix kind of came back a little bit. There's a lot of playoff experience on that Phoenix team, even if they can't execute quite as well as Minnesota, not surprised that they were able to make it a game, but then Minnesota pulls ahead late. And then after leading by as many as 12, Seattle, kind of had a rough go of it in the fourth quarter against Las Vegas. Las Vegas defeats Seattle in game one of that series, number four versus number five, which as we would expect was the closest game of the day uh, because those are the two seeds that are the closest together. So big picture, these first rounds, they go very quickly, right? Best of three, you get one as the, as the lower seed, you got to steal a game to be able to get a game, right? You have to be able to win in one of these first two games away from home to get a chance to close it out on your home court. The way the WNBA does it is they do home, home away to make sure that the higher seeds get a chance to kind of sweep at home rather than feeling like they are pressured to go to a lower seed. Again, I have thoughts about that, but I think some of these are going to get wrapped up kind of quickly. I'm very bad at predictions. So maybe if I say it, the opposite thing is going to happen, but I do think New York is too much for Atlanta. I, again, I think Atlanta should feel very proud about the push that they made to make it to the postseason this year. New York looks even better than they did last year. They made a, a big kind of lineup switch even going into this series where they took Vandersloot and had Courtney Vandersloot come off the bench. They had Leonie Fivich come. She went ahead and started after starting in sort of that middle period of the season, added some length to their roster, adding a little bit more of some scoring to that starting five. And so I think that's just a really good example of, of the Liberty have so many different ways that they can make tweaks and they can beat you with their depth. And, and Brianna Stewart had another very good game as well. So I do think that the Liberty are going to be too much for the dream. However, though, it was just nice to see like Tina Charles in the playoffs again. I can't lie. It was nice to see some of those players. Atlanta is such an interesting project to me. I can understand why they might actually have some people who are a little bit impatient with where that project is going, because I think if you look talent wise, it doesn't make sense why they were a distant eighth this year. So as, as much as it is nice to see those players get the opportunity to play in the playoffs you have to think oh maybe do they eventually want more than than what they've been given with the dream so far i also think that this is going to be tough sledding for minnesota another really big storyline this week has been sort of the off and on of whether this is diana Taurasi's last year i think things are leaning towards yes 
Tarasi is not the kind of player who is going to do a big kind of going away tour or retirement tour. However, the Mercury did do a couple things that lead you to believe that this is it. They had her speak at her final home regular season game because, like I said, there's no guarantee for them as the lower seed that they're going to make it back to Phoenix at any point in this season. Like I said, with the way that game played out against Minnesota, I'm not sure they're making it back to Phoenix. Um, they had her speak. They honored her. It was they, they did this whole if this is it promotional plan to see if, if fans just to be like, listen, you have to take this seriously. We don't know if Diana Trossi is going to be back next year. The way she talked about it, there have been little moments too. When when Phoenix was in Chicago for their last game against Chicago, Tarasi brought one of her old teammates in who was based in Chicago and had that teammate come in and, and speak to the locker room. And the way she talked about playing in LA, which is her hometown, it's where she grew up, talking about the experiences she had playing in Los Angeles, the way she talked after that game. The way she spoke to Dewana Bonner after Phoenix's final game against Connecticut, they did a jersey swap and it just felt very final. There are these moments that lead you to believe that this is it for Diana Taurasi. And I do just think, I mean, even Nafisa Collier said after this game, it was, it was playfully, but she was like, I hope we we finish her career this week because that is the ultimate goal for any team and that's respect. And I that even leads me to believe, or leads me to, I have a memory. I, I, I kind of equate this. I mean, we all saw how Sue Bird kind of stepped away from the league, right? Where she did do the one more year. Everyone knew it was her final year, but she didn't make it to the mountaintop her final year, but they do make the playoffs. It was a very good year, but you could see that it was sort of, it was the end. It was the end for Sue Bird. For Candace Parker, it was even kind of this different thing where she, she came back, but then she got injured. And so she wins a title, but she doesn't win a title on the court. She intends to return. So maybe she can win a title on the court in 2024 and then has to abruptly retire due to injury with Tarasi. It's kind of a similar thing where the Phoenix Mercury that have been put together this season are certainly better than the Phoenix Mercury that were put together last season, but they're in seventh. And it seems likely that this is going to be it for them this week, playing a, a much better executing team in Minnesota. And, and thus maybe this ends for Diana Taurasi, but I think that's not necessarily a bad way to go. I mean, we've had to deal with a lot of retirements on this show already. And even just in the last couple of years, some true legends of the game have, have stepped away. And sometimes that is just kind of the arc of a season where you, you put your best together and, and even if this isn't this isn't the the finish that you would expect, sometimes it is still just time. That is the sense I get from Phoenix. Going on to the Connecticut versus Indiana game. Now, th this is like a difference between like reality and what I would like, right? The reality is that the Connecticut Sun have a lot more playoff experience than the Indiana Fever. Player for player, they can match up with the Fever very well. It's not even a level of them having to, having to overcome anything in particular when playing the Indiana Fever. And also the Connecticut Sun... This is a big matchup because the Fever are very popular. They've had a wonderful season. It's their first time in the playoffs since 2016. They have some young superstars who are playing really well, and you want to see those players take that next step. The Caitlin Clark of it all, right? You're seeing her in her first WNBA playoff series. That is unique. It is novel. It is fun to watch, and you are rooting for that underdog maybe to, to keep pushing, and you want to see more of that. You want to give that team more time to develop. But the Connecticut Sun have other things on the horizon than just the Indiana. A fever. I think that, yes, this is a matchup that I think the Sun have, have relished. It's fun to play the team that, you know, you so many people are rooting for, and you even had those Indiana fans in Connecticut on Sunday. You could hear them on the broadcast. It's fun to be like, no, we are the team that knows what we're doing here. We are the playoff team. We are the veteran team, and we're going to teach you a thing or two. That's a fun thing to do. But I also think the Sun have bigger fish to fry. This is just the first round. The Sun have made it so close. I keep talking about the mountaintop. They've made it so close to the mountaintop so many times. And these these players like Alyssa Thomas, like Dewana Bonner, you have Marina Mabry who made that who made that move midseason because she wants to play for a title contender. You see those players. You got Brianna Jones. Like these players who have not won a ring together. Yes, they're excited to play the fever, but they are also excited to hopefully do the building blocks to get all the way to the end. And so this, I think it's twofold for the sun. I think they had a lot of fun on Sunday. You could see that DJ Carrington played really well. I think she's so cool. Such a superstar. Mabry played really well. You had those like quietly solid games from which Alyssa, well, quietly Alyssa Thomas had a triple double. And so it's, it's two things happening at once. However, as much as I recognize that and enjoy that and actually very much enjoyed elements of that game on Sunday because it was fun to see the sun kind of executing on all these different levels and, and doing such a nice job in front of their home crowd. I am also a little bit, this is where I, I get a little bit on my soapbox about the playoff structure. If you are new to the WNBA, you might not know that 
even very recently, as recently as 2021, they used to do single game eliminations in the first round of the playoffs. And the first two seeds would get a bye. So if you got number one or number two in the regular season, you would not have to do single elimination. But if you were third through eighth, you would have to get single elimination. And that very much favored the underdog because an underdog could walk into someone else's home court have an amazing game. You just need one, an amazing game. You've knocked the higher seed out. You move on. That is what predicated, and I keep coming back to it, but that's what that was the, the basis that truly allowed a team that was at 500, which was the Chicago Sky in 2021, to make it all the way to a championship because they were a lower seed. And so they had kind of fewer mechanisms in which to fail against teams that had done much better than them in the regular season. So after that, rightfully higher seeds are like, Hey, this is not, it's not working. We don't want to see these really great teams go out so early. Yes. Upsets are fun, but it gives sort of this free for all feeling to the playoffs. That isn't fair because as we know in, in basketball, you don't even get an award for, for, you know, getting the number one seed right in the, in the regular season. So they change things and move it to this best of three where everyone plays, which again, I like, I think you want to feel played in. I don't think it actually helps higher seeds not to play the home home away of it all though. That is maybe where I start to feel like, okay, have we moved the pendulum too far in the other direction? Are we too anti upset here where you have a higher seed, like a three to a six or a four to a five, especially a four to a five. I was watching the aces play the storm and I was thinking, I don't understand functionally why the storm don't deserve a home game, like a guaranteed home game here. When you look at the differences between these two teams, I think, I think the argument is like cry more, play better in the regular season. I do understand that. But I, as someone who would like to see more of these games with stakes, I think that there is more movement that can be done to the WNBA postseason, And I think it will come with expansion. Expansion is needed first. You can't expand playoff series until you have more teams involved or at least more teams, like same amount of playoff teams, but you need more variety in who those teams could be. And I think that's coming. They're obviously adding multiple teams. We've got three teams on the books now with golden state, Toronto, and now Portland. But I just, I think it's a little bit too anti upset. And that brings me back to Connecticut versus Indiana, which is that I'm watching this first game and I'm going, yeah, Indiana, Indiana, they took they took a pop to the face as they're they have very very little playoff experience they are a young team Clark had a rough game you could just kind of see those those struggles and just how much Connecticut locked down defensively but I'm also like it would be kind of nice if the end of fever had a guaranteed home playoff game not like a decider this is where I think it's like strange right I don't think the Indiana fever should have a home playoff game where they could get to do the upset and it's their one home playoff game. I'm like, no, I think a 1-1-1 one, one, one feels better. We have the charter flights now. There is the schedule that you can do this. I think you should do home away home where a team like Indiana, you know, it's it's been come with some controversy, but they're a very well-supported team. They have a huge fan base that has showed up and shown out all season. I think they've seen this, you know, they've seen this team do things that they could never do before. It is certainly not since Tamika Catchings retired. And I think that they deserve to get a playoff game. I think it would be good for the vibes. I think it would be good for the WNBA. I think that every team maybe kind of deserves this. So my big pitch is I think that the Connecticut Sun are going to win this series. I think they should win this series. I think it's not only because of, again, all of those things stacked in their favor, but just how well they're playing and how little room for error there is in a best of three series. But I also just kind of want this one to get, get to Gainbridge. I want it to get to Indianapolis for the vibes. So I'm hopeful that maybe this is a Connecticut in three situation, because I think when you just get the full sweeps, with every single one of these series is sometimes you can also go, okay, where does this need to be tweaked? So off my soapbox about that, you know, I, at this point you say to Indiana, if you want the home game, you got to earn it. But that's my little take on this. And that also leads me again to the other matchup, the storm versus aces matchup. So actually, you know what? I have more complaints. I, <laughs> I have more takes here. The, the aces did not start this game very well. They were hosting, they're hosting as the number four seed. They're hosting the number five seed. As people might know about, we've talked about it a lot this season, the two-time defending champion aces. They have the unanimous MVP, Asia Wilson, very much deserved. That was announced Sunday morning. So that was announced the morning of the playoffs. Based on social media, it seems like maybe Wilson and her teammates had found out the day before. Wilson then has to do like a full press conference and has to give a speech and talk to the commissioner and take photos before the game. And she had to like, she had to put on like what an outfit, like a non game day outfit to, to do all of that. And then she had to change and then do another thing in the arena. I am not a fan 
of making a player as, as lovely as it is to win MVP. I am not a huge fan of making a player do all of that right before a playoff game. I think that's hard. I think everyone could see even just how emotional this unanimous MVP, her third MVP award. She's only the fourth player in league history to get a third MVP award. She is not even 29 years old and she is already accomplishing all of these things. And we know the pressure that she's felt like she's been under this season and how much the aces need her to execute. I am not a huge fan of doing all of that right before a playoff game. Now, it all worked out, right, for, for the Aces in their perspective, right? They do win this game. But I do think that affected Wilson in the first half. And she had a little bit of a rough first half, but she locked it in the second half, which made kind of the storm collapse in the fourth quarter a little bit strange. The storm jump out to a lead. The lead at some point was even double digits. They look very comfortable kind of swapping baskets with the Aces. So the Aces even kind of come back. They make it close for much of the second half. It was like a two to six point game in either direction. But you saw these teams swapping buckets and that third quarter Seattle was kind of taking what the aces were giving them and they were kind of sticking with it and they were keeping that slim lead there was some bad shooting in this game Jewel Lloyd did not have a very good game and she was actually benched for a significant portion of the game Kelsey Plum on the other side did not have a very good game but then you saw in the fourth quarter yes the aces started playing some some really nice lockdown defense but also just the storm lost their touch they didn't score a single field goal in the fourth quarter they they had two points in the entire fourth and they were two free throws by Skylar Diggins Smith didn't necessarily think that storm head coach Noel Quinn made some amazing in-game adjustments there like I said I don't know exactly also what you do when you're having such a cold day from one of your best shooters in Lloyd I I'm just so curious because again these series are so short Not as short as a single game, but still pretty short, especially if you lose two games to nothing, right? What did the Storm, who did the Storm want to be is really my question. And I've really been struggling with this all season. They are a storied program with legends that have come through their halls. They are a winning program. They have had all-stars. They had all-stars this year. Neka Agwumike got a very nice amount of MVP votes this year, and it was very much deserved. Neka Agwumike, a new free agent who wanted to go play for the Storm. They have the facilities. They have the home the home court advantage. They have, well, not, not in this game, but they have all of these different things that make free agents want to come play for them. They, they were able to compile this team of Agwumike and, and Diggins Smith and Jewel Lloyd. Ezi Magbagor did not play in this game, and I do think that that had a significant impact on how the Storm were able to turn their defense into offense. I think maybe that is, if you're looking at the basketball reason, I think that is the trickiest thing for them in this Aces series is that if they don't have the defense happening, it is very, very difficult for them to put together a half-court offense. They they thrive on turning their defense into offense, and they didn't have someone like Magbagor who could, who could post up against Wilson in that second half. But I do think that at this point, we are getting into existential questions for, for the Storm as they are on the brink of elimination. They are, again, they are respected. They are storied. They have a good team. They win more often than they lose. But what does that mean in these kind of postseason stretches where it just seems like they don't have the matchup right to beat a team that is perhaps, again, above them in the standings? I would love, again, to see the Storm take this one to three. I think that, honestly, I think that they have to. I don't know if it is enough to say that the Storm have to defeat the Aces here. Because, again, the Aces, they are, they are, they have Wilson. They have Chelsea Gray playing as well as she has all season. They can handle a tough night from someone like Plum or someone like Jackie Young. They can overcome that in ways they struggled with before. They've been giving Sidney Colson a lot more minutes than they did last year. And I think Sidney Colson has been a nice presence coming off of the bench, a little bit of 3 and D from her. Like, I think... The aces are a tricky out and they are much better now than they were when they were suffering those losses that kind of put them into that fourth spot. Right. But if you are the storm and you believe that you should have the ability to be the protagonist here, as opposed to just combating what the other team is doing, I think you have to take this to three or you have to ask yourselves, who are we in this new era of the WNBA and who do we want to be? So game twos are on Tuesday and Wednesday. I think we might see a couple sweeps. Like I said, I think the top two is going to be really, really tough. I think for Atlanta or Phoenix to snipe a game two away from home. Indiana, I'm going to be frank. What I saw on Sunday did not look like a team that was going to be able to take this to three as much as I would like to see it. Like I said, make it a little bit spicy. I think Connecticut has their eye on the prize. And I think Stephanie White, their their head coach, is the right person to keep them focused on that. I, I just don't think the Sun are going to let, certainly not let this one slip. I don't know if I think that they are 
the the front runners for this for this title this year but i don't think they are all going to see a first round exit i think i would be shocked four and five though like i said i think the expectation from me i don't know if i think this will necessarily happen but my expectation of a team like the storm is they have got to take this to three but i'm excited to see what happens i love the WNBA playoffs i can't wait for the games to get a little bit closer i think games two will be closer than game one you get your feet wet you learn kind of how to in-game make adjustments and you push the other team who maybe is already looking. Sometimes they do this. Sometimes they're already looking to the next series. So can't wait to see how all of that plays out this week. Moving on to the NWSL. We are not in the playoffs in the NWSL. NWSL moving a little bit at a slower pace than the WNBA. But we did get two more teams qualified for the playoffs. We now have four of the eight playoff spots accounted for after Orlando and Washington had already clinched last weekend or even the weekend prior we now have gotham and we have kansas city clinched for the playoffs this makes sense i say this over and over and over again it's kind of the top four and then everybody else and we're going to talk about maybe just one game that felt very indicative of big picture it was that clash between the washington spirit and the kansas city current this weekend that very much went in kansas city's favor and then we're going to do a couple quick hits because we are at this point where sometimes things are a big deal and sometimes they are not but we now have finally this confirmation that yes these top four teams are the teams that are pushing for the shield and they are the teams that are probably going to host games i think orlando actually has already clinched hosting which is wild to say and the race for for five through eight is interesting but hard to predict and hard to analyze because there's a lot of teams that maybe look very different from week to week so i do want to hone in on kansas city's big three to nothing win over the washington spirit i think this result was a little bit shocking i had said last week about how kansas city had had sort of this skid they get back into form, but also against Orlando, they're kind of conservative. They have this nil-nil draw. You think this is a good result against this team, but it's obviously not a result that a team that maybe wants to contend for the Shield wants to get. They want to be winning games. They want to be true to themselves, right? This game against the Spirit was the current, like, to the max. This was maximum current, peak current. And it actually has me, I'm like, I've, I've made some bold conclusions after this game in what I think the rest of the season looks like for the Kansas City current and what playoff current looks like, which maybe the current are not going to get the shield this year, right? Maybe that is Orlando. This is a season, though, where I think if I'm a team that is falling behind in the shield race. I start going, okay, we're going to shield curse this thing. We're going to make the playoffs. We're going to be playing really, really well. And then we're going to play some playoff soccer that gets results. So this moment for Kansas City, again, three to nothing win. Some big things happen. They score very early. They score multiple times. This didn't have anything to do with the current themselves, but Washington Spirit star Trinity Rodman does have to leave this match with what was described by her agent the next day as an intense back spasm that obviously shaped the game for the current or for the for the spirit. We also saw the spirit get be issued a late red card to Lena Solano late in this game for a challenge on Kansas City's goalkeeper. The spirit did not look completely up for this this week it wasn't even just what kansas city was doing but it was also you just saw maybe a lack of creativity in the final third you saw a lot of shots from distance that were pretty easy for for the kansas city defense to scrape up and, and i think you can see maybe the spirit are starting to feel some of the attrition they didn't have sar this week obviously cory bethune is out for the rest of the season they're trying to work players into this attack that have less experience on the pitch with their teammates and we're seeing the growing pains of that the, re the whole point of that though is you you take this l this week and you keep working on that if you don't know who you're going to have available so that you're able to overcome these issues later in the season or going into the postseason which as we know the spirit will be playing in for the first time since 2021 but the lack of creativity for the spirit felt like mental fatigue in a way that i don't think was always warranted by the current's performance but that is maybe my point here's my thesis on the kansas city current and here is why i think the kansas city current are going to be a very difficult team to play in the postseason first things first i think they're going to try to lock up a top four seed which means that they will be playing at home as we know playing at cpkc is not fun for the other team only orlando has really come in and like turned that around right the other thing is that i think the kansas city current are, are getting more used to kind of playing through their own identity and we've joked i mean we had lola bonta on this podcast and we were joking about how the kansas city current do not play like a vladko andonovsky team and i think that that has been sort of the story of the season for them in both positives and negatives 
They don't play like a Vladko Andonovsky team. Their defense is is perfectly fine, and I think they have found the right personnel. They have that Kayla Sharples. They have Alana Cook. They've put Schultz in back in goal. I think that those moves are very sturdy. I think they have a lot of veteran experience back there. It's been nice to see Elizabeth Ball play alongside those players, too. I think that's been going very well. They made some personnel shifts to solidify the defense but i also just don't still don't think that they are the most formidably defensive team in this league that has never been how they played but what we saw against washington was that the defense can be the attack the attack is the defense the attack controls all for the kansas city current you pin you pin the other team back with your offense. You nullify the other team's offense with your attack. You make them run out of ideas. You implement mental fatigue that makes things easier on your defense with the way the attack plays. The attacking firepower on the Kansas City Current right now with kind of their building people back into fitness is incredible. Lola Bonta, Nichelle Prince, Vanessa DiBernardo, Michelle Cooper, Haley Mace out wide, and then Temwa Chawinga is is the the person that makes all of it work. And then you also have Bia coming back from injury, and she's getting more and more minutes in the second halves of these things. You saw Trinity Rodman burning rubber throughout this game just to keep Chawinga off the ball. She was like on corner. She was defending corner kicks way, way, way back, doing aerial challenges to keep Temwa Chawinga away from the ball. They were able. The Kansas City was able to nullify the Washington's greatest playmakers by making those playmakers constantly worried about what was going to happen if the ball started going in the other direction. I also kind of feel like a a big brain genius talking about Nichelle Prince's playmaking abilities last week when I was talking about Kansas City, or maybe it was two weeks ago, I don't remember, because she had a huge impact. She scores the first goal. She heavily influences the second. Nichelle Prince is a player who is coming back from a serious injury that has I don't know if it has changed the way that she played, but even before that injury, when she was playing for the Houston Dash in 2022, that was when Juan Carlos Amaros, who has gone on since to win a championship with Gotham, was was coaching the team for a brief period of time. He was implementing her as a playmaker, as more of a defensive ball winner, space creator with her movement that made it very difficult for the other team to progress the ball and also helped her teammates open up spaces. And that is how we're seeing Andonovsky. That is actually kind of the quintessential Andonovsky player. A defensive 10 or a defensive false nine is the quintessential Andonovsky player, right? To have someone who can disrupt the other team and and have those, those other elements to your game that isn't just finishing. And obviously her finishing over the weekend was very good as well. Prince has been a really nice part of this attack so far when she's been able to get in being healthy. And then again, you just have to talk about Schwinga. She scores her 16th goal of the season this weekend. She has now scored the most goals in a single season NWSL season since 2019. She is two goals away from matching Sam Kerr's 2019 single season record of goals scored. She is on pace. The crazy thing is I don't know if Temma Schwinga is going to win MVP because Barbara Banda exists. And Barbara Banda has been possibly even more impactful per game for a team that is breaking records in such a historic way that it is very difficult to bet against Barbara Banda. But Temo Chawinga, as an attacker, is just doing incredible things. And the fact that other teams have to think about her all the time really changes the face of these games for Kansas City. Now, we've seen that go poorly, right? We've seen when Kansas City goes too far into Chawinga ball where they are not trying to pull space. They are not trying to interplay. They're not trying to find each other. They're simply getting it to Chewinga and praying. But when they are using her as a player that not only does the other team need to fear, but they can't both fear Chewinga and do the attack, or they can't fear Chewinga and also you know, follow Nichelle Prince's trailing run or, or keep up with Michelle Cooper out on the wide, on the wide spaces or track Labonta when she comes in like you you would need all of these pieces moving together to make a player like Chawinga tick and make her ability to score and to her pace and her ability to beat defenders work for you that was all happening at a 10 for Kansas City in this game and it turned into a three to nothing win over a team that I also believe to be a championship contender that is who I believe Kansas City should be in the postseason I think they need to approach it with, we have put together the personnel and the defense to not make big mistakes. That is the number one thing. No big mistakes in the defense. And then utilize your ball progression and your offensive movement and the different abilities of your attacking players to make other teams scared 
mess with their playoff strategy and, and, and profit and make it all the way to CPKC in November. I think that that is how the current can do this. And I felt watching this game, you don't want to get too hype over just one game, but that looked like the blueprint to me. And I think they can do that against just about anybody, but Orlando, because they have that same, actually very similar structure in the way, except possibly a better defense. So that's why Orlando kind of is, is the model is because they have those players in the midfield and the attack that can nullify what you want to do, but they also have one of the sturdiest defenses in the league. So feeling good about Kansas city, also feeling good about Gotham. They also cleansed a playoff spot this week, kind of a sturdy win for them. One to nothing over Utah. It was the, the goal was quintessential Gotham. They force a turnover in the, the middle third, or maybe possibly it was kind of close to the attacking third. The ball movement is wonderful. They've got a trailing run from Yasmin Ryan. She sinks it one to nothing. Gotham is into the playoffs. This is, I'm just going to wrap into my larger thesis for this week, which is just, I think there's a lot of good ideas about how to play beautiful football throughout a season to contend for a shield. But sometimes when push comes to shove, you just got to stick to your roots. And I think that's what we're seeing from a team like Gotham as well. In addition to some of the nice build-up play that they can do, force a turnover, move the ball quickly, put the ball in the back of the net. That is playoff soccer. And I think we're starting to see these teams kind of hone in on that. So a couple just quick end of NWSL takes. I, I'm not going to be completely exhaustive, but just some things that stuck out to me. I, again, kind of looking at the playoff picture, perhaps. North Carolina, who I do think is going to qualify for the playoffs eventually. They lose away from home again, this time to Louisville. My hot take on North Carolina is I think they're going to have a difficult path through the postseason if they cannot clinch top four. And they are not at this moment particularly close to doing so they are very very good at home they don't lose at home like ever 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 but they also really struggle on the road so North Carolina I think is in order to not be a big what if I think they have to be look very carefully at what that playoff picture looks like if they have to go on the road in the quarterfinals and the semifinals and what that means for them and how they play the Chicago Red Stars are the exact opposite give them a tricky game away and they cook. They love the underdog mentality. They play without the ball. They do not overly possess. They wait for the other team to make a mistake, and they pounce on it. They did get a win at home this weekend, that which made me feel pretty good about the Red Stars finishing above the playoff line. They're still not safe by any means, but I think if they can keep getting these results in the last five games of the season, I think they're going to be in a good place. But yeah, Chicago and North Carolina are like the complete opposites of each other in terms of how they play home and away. So Chicago might be very comfy if they get, you know, six, seven, eighth they're like fine see you in the first round and let's see what happens even below the playoff line I do think maybe we I've talked about panic mode versus not panic mode for Seattle I do think this loss to the dash this weekend is pretty tough I don't know at what point they go into change everything mode but that that feels pretty demoralizing to me coming off of a championship game again I always talk about like being close to the top of the mountain but falling this far for Seattle I am really curious at what point they feel like they need to start making major changes tonight's game that between Angel City and Portland feels kind of like a must win for both we are getting into that realm with these teams both are in danger of letting positive play get away from them portland obviously safer above the playoff line but this feels like a big one like i talk about those kind of bellwether games portland is going to want to win this game and angel city is going to know that they sh cannot lose it if they want to make the postseason and then my final thought about nwsl wrapping all the way back to orlando like i said orlando this well put together team with this sturdy defense and this offense that cannot miss. I'm curious, is Orlando starting to get a little bit too close to the other side of the shield curse line? I talk about that with Kansas City, right? Maybe if the shield is getting away from you, you say, yeah, that's fine. Take the shield. We'll see you in the postseason. Orlando has not lost a game. This game was very, very close. They were playing Bay FC. It was a good performance from Bay FC. It seemed like they were actually close to kind of pulling this one off, pulling off maybe that first big upset against Orlando this season. There's a late header goal by Banda, one nothing win to Orlando. I always say this about the psychology of it. I kept saying this about South Carolina women's basketball, and it did not matter, which is what does it do to you mentally if you haven't suffered your first loss before you go into win or go home? And I am really curious what that means for the Orlando Pride. They don't want to lose. It's obvious in these games that they're actually working through problems and finding ways to win. But there have been some higher analytics that have indicated that they're maybe out shooting some of their ball progression. They're all on a hot streak right now. And as we know, it's a, it's a mixture of skill and luck to do something as incredibly impressive as they've done with this unbeaten streak. And, and so I, I am always curious. This is maybe the question for the fans, if you're an Orlando fan or maybe a fan of a different team 
is you've got five games less of the season, five games left. And as we know, draws kind of muddy the waters a little bit. I'm not going to act like a draw is a fabulous result all the time for a team like Orlando. And so it's not like they didn't lose or they haven't lost. It's not like they won every game this season. So you can have those different like middling results and learn from them rather than having to take a loss. But I do wonder if they start to get a little bit stressed out about the idea of going into a postseason completely undefeated, because I think that that is a difficult road to walk. But again, the the teams that they are mimicking in, in this scenario are, you know, the 2018, 2019 North Carolina Courage. And as we know, they had no trouble hitting on both. So uh, very fascinated to see kind of where this goes for the pride, but another good win for them. It was gritty. Uh, they were able to stay focused for the entire game. You have a player like Banda, like I said, is getting closer and closer, I believe, to having her hands on that MVP trophy and well-deserved. But yeah, I'm curious to see how people feel psychologically about where Orlando is at. And then some other quick sports shout out. I've been enjoying doing these. If you like these, let me know. If you just want to hit on the big sports, I don't know, let me know too. But I've just really been liking doing these little roundups because there's a lot of stuff going on. We're like deep into the the first semester of the school year, right? So for college sports, we're seeing some things and I just kind of like keeping an eye on other stuff that's happening. So volleyball volleyball check-in nebraska volleyball so back it's like it's they're constantly like the we're so back it's so over we're so back nebraska sweeps stanford very good result from them there and then they beat louisville in a tight one yeah nebraska they they are they are not number one that goes to Pitt, and Pitt has looked very 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 good they beat penn state this week and it was not close but yeah i the the corn huskers the the sound of their demise is a little bit early maybe but yeah the non-conference for volleyball has been very fun to watch cool to see the Nebraska machine kind of kickstart back up. You have Pitt on top here. They've they've gotten fabulous results so far this season. Interesting to see Texas struggle a little bit and sort of what that looks like in the big picture. Like you do have a team like Louisville who I think is very good, but they are not unbeatable, right? Speaking of Stanford, Stanford, just welcome to the ACC, to Stanford. I, we're starting to see some of these results come together, whether it is volleyball or I'm going to mention college soccer. I think this is going to be true for college basketball going into this season where the Stanford meets the ACC is this the the reconfiguration of these conferences i worry very much specifically about a stanford student athlete having to deal with that the travel is immense as we know the academic rigors at stanford are very very high i worry about these women teams for stanford but if you're looking at competitively how interesting is it to see a team that is so good at these different women at women's athletics join this conference, this ACC conference that also is known as a powerhouse for some of these different sports. Stanford soccer has joined what I believe to be the best conference in women's NCAA women's soccer, and, and they fell to Wake Forest. They were number one in the they were number one in the in the country, and they fall to Wake Forest. Wake Forest had also just beaten Virginia, which was a very big win for them. You're going to see it again, I think, in women's basketball. You see a Stanford basketball team that's very good and has seen some movement because of this conference realignment and also the retirement of Tara Vanderveer. But these conference games are going to rip. Like, I think Stanford in the ACC, especially women's soccer, is incredible. You're going to see some really good ACC games in, in basketball, and I think you're going to continue to see it in volleyball as well. So just kind of a personal shout-out to Stanford. I think what these teams are having to do is very difficult, but also what interesting matchups that we're going to see to see one of the best women's sports programs across these different sports move into some of the best conferences for these same women's sports. And then finally, I want to do a quick shout out to the U.S. Women's National Team U-20s. They earned third at the U-20 World Cup. Uh, I talked about their very dramatic win to make it to the semifinals. They did lose to North Carolina, North Korea in their semifinal. Uh, but it is their best finish since 2012. Uh, that was the last time that the U.S. has won it. So that third place finish is their best finish since winning it in 2012. You could tell, actually, it was very kind of emotional for these players. They were very relieved and excited to bring an edge at the youth levels for the U.S. for the first time in a long time. North Korea actually went on to win the World Cup. Japan got second. Ali Sentner gets the bronze ball. She has had a fabulous year for both club and country. Very excited to see what she does coming back to Utah for the end of the season. And, and even though I had some qualms, perhaps, about like player rotations and some of the in-game management, during this tournament i just again I, i'm going to say again i think it's very nice that the u.s took this so seriously they pulled players from very good college teams and they pulled players from very good professional teams and the experience that those players got was incredible and just shout out to them because that is a grueling tournament these are young people who are figuring this out and getting third is really really impressive so i'm very very happy for the u.s women's national team u20s this has been this week's edition of the late sub i am your host claire watkins shout out to producer extraordinaire parker fenton we will be back next week with more WNBA playoffs more nwsl stuff to talk about we might have a few interviews for you next time we're trying to get some things on the books that i think are really exciting and we cannot wait to dive into more in the world of women's sports mm-hmm.